The Lion Boy, Chapter 7 About an hour later, Charlie heard noises at the top of the ladder and realised that someone was climbing down. He had no time to think what to do, even to decide whether or not to hide before the person was standing in the cockpit, staring at him out of big brown eyes and saying, Francis, regardez, il un garçon ici, une petite africaine. Charlie's French was pretty good. Brother Jerome was very keen on languages, so he understood what she was saying. Francis, look, there's a boy here, a little African. As for what she was, Charlie knew exactly. She was slender but muscly, wearing tights and a tight top with a short skirt. She had her dark hair pulled up in a bun so tight that it made her face look too tight too. In fact, everything about her was tight except her skirt, which flared out like the petals on a daisy. The tight hair even pulled all the expression off her face. She stood with her weight on one leg and her arms crossed. She was quite clearly a ballerina, except she looked way too tough and he didn't know why she was going on about him being African. She'd obviously had African blood too. Francis appeared behind her, a black-haired young man in fringed pony skin chaps, a waistcoat and a hat. He had red tooled holster, fancy Cuban heeled boots to match and two shiny little guns, one of which he pulled out and was aiming at Charlie. Charlie was not at all sure about being held up by a tough African ballerina talking French and a cowboy in red boots. Bonjour, he said. Salut, said the ballerina. Francis nodded. They didn't seem entirely unfriendly. Uh, could you put the gun down? asked Charlie politely in French. The ballerina looked over her shoulder and rolled her eyes to heaven in exasperation. <sighs> She berated Francis in a swift and complicated French which Charlie couldn't follow. It sounded a bit like Celtic as well, so perhaps it was a dialect, saying it was obvious. Put away, put us away, don't be such an incompoop, it's only a kid. Or words to that effect. Also, as Charlie looked more closely at the little gun, he suspected that it wasn't real. It was so small and shiny and somehow looked too light. In fact, nothing about the cowboy looked real. He wasn't sunburned for a start, and his clothes were too colourful. And there was a monkey on his shoulder, and the monkey was wearing fringed pony skin chaps and a red gun belt too. No, this was no ordinary cowboy. Francis put the gun away, and the ballerina said that she supposed they'd better take him up. Charlie, knowing that his only alternative was to try and jump overboard, be pulled out again and taken up anyway, dripping wet and having annoyed everybody, pulled his things into his bag and slung it over his shoulder. Come on, said the ballerina, and poked him up the ladder to the ship. Charlie didn't like being poked. She wasn't that much older than him anyway to be bossing him around. It was amazing, thought Charlie, how something so crimson could look so tough. But this was a tough ship. The great flanks, the thick ropes coiled on the decks, the huge fenders dripping salt water and weed over the side, the massing, massive masts and great industrial funnels, the brawny sailors with their sunburn and squinty eyes. The ship made a music of her own, a creaking and rumbling of engines and furnaces, or ropes in the wind, of beams and joists surging through the water. Charlie, nervous as he was, felt a huge thrill at being aboard this great ship as she headed out to sea. Go on, said the ballerina. She prodded him along the deck until they came to a cabin door, carved with gold and vines which stood ajar. Maestro, called the ballerina, knocking on the door. E que le chose? Charlie didn't quite like being introduced as here is something. But the ballerina prodded him again and he stumbled into the room, tripping over the little ledge which cabin doors always have at the bottom to keep shallow flood water out. The chamber was small but magnificent and standing in the middle, leaning on a small desk, was the most magnificent person. He must have been six and a half feet tall, broad shouldered in white breeches and a green velvet tailcoat and his fine blonde hair, almost as pale as ice, hung down his back in a thick pigtail. 
His eyes were piercing blue, his skin pale and dry, and he looked as if he'd stayed up far too late and had done so all his life. In one pale hand he had a glass of what looked like brandy, and before him on the desk were a pile of papers and a large metal box absolutely full of money. Masses of it, in notes. Charlie stared. He had never seen a man who looked like this before. For God's sake, said the man in French, but with an accent Charlie recognised to be Southern Empire. Now what? I found this boy, said the ballerina, in the police guy's boat. Throw him overboard then, said the man. OK, she said, turning round, made to prod Charlie out of the door again. Charlie's heart leapt. No, wait a moment, he said. Bring him back. You speak French? Yes, said Charlie in French. My name's Charlie and I'm looking for my mum and dad who have disappeared. I hitched a lift with the polishing machine. He meant to say police guy, but he got the word wrong and said policier instead of policia, an easy mistake. Really, said the man, unimpressed with this brief history. He looked at Charlie for a moment, sizing him up. He took hold of Charlie's arm and squeezed it. Boy, he said, are you strong? Quite, sir, said Charlie, but I'm more clever than strong. How clever, said the magnificent man. I can speak English, French, Twi, Arabic, Latin, Greek and Italian, he said. He never told people that he could speak cat. He had always known, without being told, that that is not something to gas about. And I can read and write and I'm quick at calculations and I can play the piano and drive and I'm an experienced sailor. He was thinking quickly of things which might make the strange pale man want to keep him on the ship rather than throw him overboard. And I can climb and ride a bicycle. The man's elegant dark eyebrows rose up to his white forehead as Charlie spoke. But he said nothing, so Charlie continued. And I can cook omelettes, foo-foo, and soup, and flapjacks, and I can do handstands, and cartwheels, and climb ropes, and I can swim, of course, and dive, and tie knots, and do a sheep shank, and a clove hitch, and I'm quite used to computers. Charlie faltered to a halt. The man was saying nothing on purpose, just to see how long Charlie would keep talking. Most impressive, said the man, after a little gap, just long enough to let Charlie know who was in charge, as if there were any doubt. But you're not strong. Quite strong, said Charlie. The man took a sip from his glass of brandy, never taking his eyes off Charlie. Now tell me, he said, of course all boys want to run away and join with us, but what precisely is your excuse? He thought Charlie had come to the ship on purpose. Oh, well, that didn't matter. What mattered was a very important thought struck Charlie. All of these people talking French. Were they going to France now? I intend to seek my fortune, sir, said Charlie, and my parents. Are you headed to France? The man put his glass down. He seemed to have made his mind up about something. What's your name? He said. Charlie Ashanti, said Charlie. Even as he said it, he thought, oh, it might have been a good idea to give a fake name, what with Raffi out there, wherever he is. Charlie, I am Major Maurice Thibodeau. He pronounced Thibodeau. Thibodeau. So, Charlie, I am Major Maurice Thibodeau. I am the boss, the leader and the voice of all authority around here. I am the ringmaster. You call me Major, Sir or Maestro. You are Charlie a little kid we've taken on. You'll do as you're told, do me a handstand. Since he was very tiny, Charlie had been playing around with the cats in the ruins and he was as agile as a little monkey. A handstand was nothing to him. Now, too taken aback to wonder why the Major wanted him to do it, Charlie swiftly upended himself. There wasn't much room, but he managed it without kicking anybody in the face. With his feet in the air and his head down by the floor, he, could see Major Mor he couldn't see Major Maurice's reaction, but he felt he shouldn't come down until he was told. So he just stayed there, while Major Maurice did his trick of doing nothing to see how long a person would carry on. OK, said Major Maurice eventually. Come down now. Could you do that on a lion's back? Charlie nearly fell as he brought himself down. What kind of question was that? Uh, yes, sir, he said with a gulp at his own bravery. He had been doing some thinking upside down. Ballerina, cowboy, music, stripy canvas, ringmaster, and now lions. Please, sir, are you a 
circus? And are you? He was trying to ask again about France, but the Major had started talking already. Are we a circus? said Major Maurice. Are we a circus? We are not a circus, boy. We are the circus. The finest and best, the most daring and most astounding, the most magnificent show on earth. He really did talk like that. His voice rose and rose and grew and grew until the little cabin was full of it and started to pour out onto the deck and the blood suddenly came to his face, making him look pink and happy, as if he had been very hungry and was drinking soup. Charlie could just imagine what he would be like in the ring, filling the big top with his rolling tones, crying out to the audience, shouting about how wonderful the show was, telling them all to roll up, roll up for the most magnificent show on earth. We are Tibidae's Royal Floating Circus and Equestrian Philharmonic Academy, he said more calmly. Known to those who can't pronounce the illustri illustrious name of Thibodeau as Tibbs Gallimorphy, and to those who can't pronounce Gallimorphy as The Show. Play your cards right, young man, and you too will be The Show. We need a young fella. Work hard, stick around, and you can start with the monkeys. Pirouette will take you down. Good day to you. The ballerina, Pirouette, gave Charlie a smile instead of a prod as she led him down the nar a narrow companionway. The corridor smelt of something Charlie could not identify. Something animal and dusty and musky. Not a bad smell, but curious for a ship. You really want to be circus, Charlie, she said. Of course I do, said Charlie. Of course I do, but listen, are we going to France? Of course she said, marching ahead. Charlie's face broke out into a grin as big as Paris. The monkeys lived in the depths of the boat in a smelly little chamber between the zebras and the Hungarian with the troop of trained bees. An Indian man, his name was Baba Hai, lived in with the monkeys in a hammock. Charlie could go in with the monkeys too, or he could sling a hammock up in the feed hold even further down in the depths of the ship, where the smell wasn't quite so monkeyish, but the air never changed. So it was still and thick and hard to breathe. Can't I sleep on deck? He asked. Bikabai. Bikabai stretched his eyes. Very cold, he said, slightly shocked. If sailor guys tread on you, it might be unpleasant. Charlie's duties were not too hard. He was to bring the monkeys food, watch Babakai as he fed them, clean their quarters and mend their clothes. Carrying the buckets of water was the worst part, once he got used to the monkey poo smell. Several of the monkeys were called Dandy Jack. Why? asked Charlie. Because they ride the ponies, said Babakai, as if that explained it. Where do we get dinner? Charlie asked. I do not eat, said Babakai. So Charlie asked where in French they were headed in, where in France they were headed instead. It matters not, so long as the journey is undertaken with a pure heart, said Babakai. Charlie thought all of this was less than helpful, and set off to find somebody with a more practical outlook and an opinion on where the dining room might be. There were at least three decks that Charlie could make out. In the deep hold was the feed, and the gods knows what else. It was dark down there and smelly and dank. Charlie found it quite impossible not to think of the deep, cold river water just on the other side of the thick, clinkered struts and the beams of the hull. The second deck, just on the waterline, was where most of the animals lived. The cabins were small and it seemed almost as if there was some <coughs> something huge in the middle of the ship and everything else could have been stuffed in willy-nilly around it to fit in as best it could. But it was a bit warmer and through the thick portals you could see greenish daylight and sky usually. Tonight in the reasonably flat waters of the river, the water line crossed right along the middle of the portholes in the monkey cabin. So you could see the sky in a semicircle and a dark water in the bottom half. The effect was peculiar and it made Charlie feel a bit ill. The upper deck where the humans lived, basked in full light and air, Pirouette had said that she had a cabin here on the port side near to Major Tibidae, which she shared with someone she called Madame Barbeau. Charlie thought that was the name. He was having a bit of trouble with the names and was pretty sure he would be calling it Tib's Show, not Tidbody's Floating Philharmonic what have you. 
Charlie decided to go and see her. She would know about dinner. She had the air of a girl who knew things. So, how to find her cavern? He asked a sailor, got lost, asked another sailor, got lost, and asked another sailor who directed him to the door in front of his nose. His knock was answered by what could only be described as a beautiful lady with large, fine, curling, silky black beard. He gulped. Hello, she said. She sounded French like pirouette. Bonjour, madame, said Charlie politely, but still goggling. How could a lady have a beard like that? Was it real? If it were fake, why would she be wearing it off duty? And goodness, what a fine beard it was. He could even smell it. A faint, clean tinge of lavender pomade. Are you looking for pirouette? she asked. Yes, madame, said Charlie. He couldn't stop staring. There were no strings that he could see, nor signs of glue. Then, quick as a bird, the lady took Charlie's hand in hers, which was cool and gentle, and put it to her cheek. You can stroke, she said, her smile curling up into the corner of her elegant moustache. You like? Charlie could tear his, couldn't tear his hand away. Her beard was beautifully soft and silky, like a very young goat's ears, or the curls between a harp calf's horns. We're about to go and eat, said the bearded lady. You like to come with us? Charlie just nodded. Bearded lady. Okay, he could handle that. Dinner took place in a long, narrow chamber along the stern on the upper deck. Everyone took their dish up to the hatch and was given a dollop of food. Tonight it was a stew with dumplings in a green and green peas and a piece of bread. Then they sat about eating and gossiping. Charlie was able to see for the first time exactly who he was heading out to sea with. There was a group of about ten tiny Italians, all of whom had long noses and cheerful expressions. Charlie guessed they were acrobats of some kind. There was a plump woman with a squint wearing overalls. Snakes, said Madame Balbo mysteriously. A rather tough-looking, short-haired man sat reading all through the meal. Mr Andrews, said Pirouette with a sniff. He leads the bears. An enormous young man came in rather late with an enormous dish. He had three helpling. He had three helpings. Hercule, strong man, said Madame Barbeau. And then a gang of energetic boys of about twenty, chatting loudly, playing around and talking about horses with Francis the cowboy. The trick riders, said Pirouette. There were various children about the place too, Charlie was pleased to see. A downtrodden looking boy with mud on his face, a curly haired boy who sat with two squabbling clowns ignoring them, and two girls of about nine who had to be twins, wearing matching shifts and imitating each other's every move. They were interesting to watch, but they made Charlie feel seasick. What do you do? Charlie asked Pirouette. I am trapezista volente, she said with a proud little smile. Gosh, said Charlie because he felt he ought. He could tell by Pirouette's tone of voice that trapezista volente was clearly fantastically cool, but he hadn't a clue what it meant. Gosh, he said again politely. The bearded lady shot him a look and winked at him. You will see, she said, when we do the show. When will that be? He asked eagerly. We go to Paris now, said Pirouette. We have a date for the big show in just one week. The Imperial Ambassador is having a big party. He invites all the Eastern politicians and we are to be the fun for them. They will all come. Paris. He tried to remember where Paris was. Sort of in the middle, but north. Certainly nowhere near the sea. So when they got to land, they could find a cat and get more information and move on. Charlie, to tell the truth, was having contradictory feelings. With the circus, he realised he felt safe. All the activity and so many people would give him some protection if Raffi was coming after him. So on the one hand, he was looking forward to snooping all over the ship, finding the animals and making friends, and above all, seeing the show, the real magic of the circus. He hoped, and hoped that it wasn't disloyal to his parents, that there'd be chances to see and do loads of things before they got to France. On the other hand, Running through his cheerful prospect like an icy current was the constant, repeating knowledge of his parents' danger, and just behind that was the figure of Raffi, cool, 
unknown, frightening, challenging. But until they reached France, there was nothing much he could do. Okay, it was frustrating, but he could handle it. Pirouette was still talking. We can only make the show in the big top. We take us to where the people are, then they come on board and we make the show. They come on board, said Charlie, who had been listening to his fears, but not to Pirouette. He wasn't sure if he was understanding right. You haven't seen the big top, said Madame Barbeau. She wondered at this boy, so alone, so distracted, yet so accepting. Oh, Charlie, we have the most beautiful big size circus ring here on the boat, with the seats and sawdust and flying trapeze and stripy tent roof and everything. Now Charlie very much wanted to hear more about how you could fit a circus ring onto a boat and where it was and where he could get to see it and when. But just at that moment, another person entered the cabin. He was not tall like Major Maurice, nor was he huge like Hercule, nor amazing like the bearded lady. He was a brown-haired, brown-skinned man of about 40, or maybe 50, an African, well-built, quiet and very calm. What was strange was that he seemed to bring a wake of calm with him. It was as if nothing that was not calm could get anywhere near him, and if it tried to, it became calm no matter what its intention had been in the first place. Silence spread out from him. Stillness formed a pool around him. Even as he walked, in the trick, ride, the, the trick riders stopped laughing and the Italians turned their faces quietly to their plates. Pirouette and Madame Barbeau stopped chatting and forced a gentleness descended on the whole company. Charlie could not take his eyes off this man. He could not understand why. Then the man turned to face Charlie and looked straight at him. His eyes were deep wells of darkness. And then, suddenly, from deep within these dark eyes, Charlie saw a flash, a reflection of light, like from an animal's eyes, as the man turned his head away again. Who is he? Charlie whispered to Madame Bardot, huddling a little closer to her. Ah, he is our dear Macomo, she said. Charlie was surprised. Was she being sarcastic? Dear was not the kind of word he would use to apply to that man. He is our lion tamer. Oh, he doesn't like us to say tamer. He is our lion trainer. He's African like you. He may be African, thought Charlie, but it's not like me. He's like, he is like the feeling you get when your father is angry at you. He's scary. And this calm he carries with him is not good. Relaxed calm. It's a calm of fear. Charlie shivered. Oh, lion tamer, eh? Well, he certainly seemed to have this lot tamed. He glanced at Pirouette. She was looking at her meal and seemed not to want to look up. Macomo had put Charlie right off his food, so he just sat and listened to the gentle conversation that flowed about the cabin as the circus people finished their dinners. One of the Italians was trying to persuade one of the others to get his mandolin out and give us a song. Mr Andrews, the bear leader, had offered part of his newspaper to the Hungarian. Some new people came in, a large, proud-looking bald man. What does he do? inquired Charlie eagerly, but Madame Bardot just gave him a look, as if to say she'd know better than to ask. There was a small group of wiry Arab boys, and very tall, elegant, pale man with feathery white hair and exceptionally long hands and feet. Charlie found himself giving Madame Bardot a pleasing look, and she relented enough to say, El Diablo Ero, Fun Mabuliste, which didn't help Charlie very much. Fun Buliste, Trapeziosa Valente, he needed a dictionary. Looking round at the dining room, Charlie thought they looked like a rather large and oddly, an odd family. He smiled to himself. He liked it here. At least he would have, if only. After dinner, the twins came over and said, both of them, Hello, we are the twins. Who are you? I'm Charlie, said Charlie. I'm helping with the monkeys. The twins looked at each other meaningfully, then continued, Major Tibb always puts people with the monkeys first. He'll have you doing something else soon. Do you have any chocolate? It was amazing the way they talked together. How could they have known to jump from talking about Major Tibb a day Actually, Major Tibb was much easier to talking about chocolate. 
If this was a trick for the show, it was a very good one. I do actually, would you like some? Yes, they said and smiled. They were weird. Charlie said goodnight to Pirouette, who had undone her tight hairdo and suddenly looked much nicer, and Madame Barbeau, who made him promise to come back to breakfast with them the next day and went off with the twins. Part of him wanted Pirouette to want him to stay with her rather than go off with the younger girls, but she said nothing, so he went. Also, he wanted to find out if the twins could talk in tandem all the time or if they would start to talk separately. Charlie didn't quite know his way back to the monkey cabin where he had left his things, but the twins were Sara and Tara, they said, were able to show him where it was. Well, they could show him where the cabin was, but not where the chocolate was. That was another thing, and no secret. The monkeys had been in Charlie's bag, and they had scoffed the chocolate, the remaining biscuits, and the sugar lumps, and the tea bags. Yuck, said the tri twins. Raw tea bag? Maybe they're one person in two bodies, Charlie thought. That would make sense. Oh, no it wouldn't, he thought again. How could one person be in two bodies? How could that make sense? Sarah and Tara then announced that they had some chocolate in their cabin. He followed them back up to the open deck, along towards the bows, right into the bows, as it seemed. Then, suddenly, the girls turned and disappeared from view. Oi! called Charlie. Where are you? Where have you gone? We're here! The girls called, and their heads popped out, as it were, from a hole in the wall by the figurehead. This is where we stay! Their cabin was right inside the figurehead's chest. It was sort of triangular, and though they had no porthole as such, if you climbed a ladder to the top corner of the curiously shaped chamber, you found yourself inside the figurehead's face. You could look out of spy holes cut into her beautiful green eyes, and you could peer through a thick glass window behind the great smiling teeth of her beguiling smile. Now, of course, there was nothing to see but a few swaying stars, misty and far away, but in the daytime, what a view that would be! When Charlie had admired the ship from the outside earlier that day, he had no idea that the figurehead was hollow, with a peculiar little room inside where the two girls lived. This is absolutely amazing, he said. This is amazing. I am amazed. The girls, acting together as always, found the chocolate. Then they unrolled their bunk and there was just enough room for all three to sit on it. There was no floor space left and to start nibble their way into the happy chocolate reverie. A knock on the door made them jump. Password, cried the twins. Book it, said a voice and the door opened and in marched the curly boy who had been with the clowns. Ah, you've got him, he cried with a cheerful tone. The twins have got him, he called over his shoulder, and from behind Charlie could hear a chattering, scrabbling sound, which turned out to be the muddy-faced boy and four or five of the smallest Italians who had come to investigate Charlie. They all tried to come in to the twins' cabin. The twins told them there wasn't room, and then a great cuckooing noise started up from behind one of the walls, and the twins said, Now look, you've woken the doves, and shooed everybody, including Charlie, out. Where are you sleeping? said the curly boy to Charlie. I don't know, said Charlie. I was meant to be in with the monkeys, but since they've thrown, been through my bag and eaten everything, I don't fancy it very much anymore. Do you want to come and kip with us in the rope store? asked the curly boy. It's above the galley, so we never get cold. It keeps the ropes dry too, so they don't rot. It's next to the lions. The boy was going on about the lions needing the heat too, but Charlie wasn't listening. Next to the lions? There were lions! He'd been told, and he knew it, but only now did it really get through to him. There were lions on this ship, and he was going to be next door to them.